good uh, evening, everyone. This is a public meeting of the uh, Community Safety Task Force, which we set up uh, some uh, months ago. And I'd like to start first by uh, introducing the members of the task force, if you could just acknowledge uh, when I call out your names. Uh, I'm John Creelman. I'm the deputy mayor. Fred Nix is my colleague, the councillor, town of Mono. Michael uh, Walker is the chair of our Police Service Bureau. Don Sinclair is a member of the uh, Police Service Bureau. Del Bernardi is a, uh, a citizen representative on the task force. And uh, lastly, Tom Power, who is a citizen representative on the, uh, uh, the task force. When we established this process, we, we started out with two objectives. One was to gather uh, as much objective data as we could to try and describe uh, what I think everybody uh, believes is a problem, both in terms of uh, speeding, uh, behavior on our roads, uh, challenges in our subdivisions insofar as uh, break and enters and other activity is concerned. Um, and objective data in many instances uh, have to do with uh, um, police uh, occurrence reports, uh, things such as uh, traffic counts and uh, the result of uh, speed measuring devices. Uh, we have um, gone a long distance in terms of the, uh, of the latter. We've been able to uh, track down uh, speed measuring uh, device uh, data uh, for a number of years thanks to the County of Dufferin and the assistance of the OPP. And my colleague, uh, Fred Nix, is going to make a presentation as to what we've discovered. Uh, and I think you'll all be quite interested in, uh, in the results there. Um, Mike Walker is going to make a presentation on the current OPP uh, policing contract. That is a contract that uh, we established in the late 1990s when I was mayor at the time. Uh, and uh, we were one of the first uh, contract uh, municipalities uh, that they uh, were able to uh, sign up. Um, we have, uh, as well, representatives of the OPP here tonight, Nikki Randall, Linda, Linda Davis, and Catherine Ross. And I believe Catherine Ross from our local detachment will be presenting um, on the question of police enha enhancement opportunities. Uh, one of the um, uh, things that we did to try and get both uh, subjective and objective uh, information was to uh, conduct a... Uh, an online survey. And uh, in that on online survey, we specifically went out of our way to, uh, uh, to ask the question, are you in favor, uh, first of all, are you happy with the level of policing? And second, are you in favor of increasing the uh, level of police, uh, policing? Uh, and would you be prepared to pay more for it? And uh, I'm just going to go through some of those uh, results uh, with you now. Um, you'll excuse the fact that I'm not very good at at PowerPoints and controlling PowerPoints, so this might get uh, randomly out of control. But I just want to start with the results of our survey. Now, the survey has been running now for a number of months, and uh, I hope that we'll continue with it for a few more weeks to uh, catch up to people who may not have uh, uh, filled it out. Uh, so what we see here uh, was captured uh, either yesterday or the day before yesterday in terms of uh, of uh, the results. So I should have been flashing this up earlier, but uh, I didn't. So the first question was, are you satisfied with the current level of, uh, of policing? We have 17 responses. 14% said yes, satisfied. 57% yes, so the combination of two indicate a majority of people seem to be satisfied with the current level of uh, policing. Uh, we have some responses indicating not satisfied, not uh, very unsatisfied. So there were 115 uh, uh, answers uh, to this question uh, at the time that we captured the data. Um, so we wanted to find out what people uh, believed was the area of greatest concern on a scale of one to uh, five, with five being of the greatest concern. Top three responses, traffic, not surprisingly, property, not surprisingly, and visibility in terms of the uh, visibility of, of policing in the community. Uh, and uh, the data uh, that, uh, that you see here uh, indicates the ranking uh, one through five uh, to each of those issues. Um, 
violence uh, does not really uh, register to the same extent as, as the others. Um, and then, of course, there's other. Um, we hopefully will be posting uh, some of this information on our website, uh, and we have a, a subsite for the community task force. So uh, if you want to follow up later, uh, we can make this information available to you. Uh, question um, with regard to are you prepared to pay more uh, to uh, change the level of policing? And I should add here that as you increase your level of uh, police coverage uh, and you increase the number of uh, tickets that are handed out, uh, we call them part one certificates or part three um, uh, matters which go by way of summons, uh, and uh, fine revenue increases, that goes a long way towards offsetting the cost. It doesn't totally offset the cost, uh, but it isn't necessarily the case that simply by adding to our police budget, we don't see some recovery. We would see some recovery. So the responses remain the same, 42.1% increase uh, slightly behind that, uh, and decrease 14%. So there are people who would like us to decrease how much we spend on policing. And I don't know. <laughs> so 114 responses at the time the data was collected. Uh, in terms of traffic enforcement, uh, we wanted to have people rank, uh, with one being the biggest uh, area of uh, concern and eight being the least area of concern. Uh, and not surprisingly, we see uh, Airport Road, Highway 9, Highway 10, Highway 89, Hockley, leading the way in terms of uh, some of the concerns. Although, as you can see, there is, uh, there is some uh, uh, concern even within the subdivisions and our, on our municipal roads. Um, I certainly found during the election, whenever I'd start ranting about uh, Airport Road, people would haul me back and say, well, you know, you, you're not even looking on your own uh, uh, road, third line. Uh, things are going on there that are pretty outrageous as well. So. Um, pretty, pretty interesting distribution of concern uh, totally across the, uh, the town. Question, uh, and this was an interesting one. Have you personally witnessed or been affected by aggressive driving? Responses, nearly 90% have been. They've either seen it or they've been affected by it. And there are people in the audience tonight I know who have been affected by it. No, 7.8%, uh, and prefer not to say we gave people that option. So 115 responses to that question. Have you uh, uh, experienced, a, uh, do you know somebody or have you experienced a property-related property, property related crime? And uh, we were very mindful and are very mindful that uh, uh, there have been concerns in the subdivisions about B&Es and uh, traffic activity in the, in the subdivisions and I certainly can attest to, to uh, uh, to hearing about that and seeing the results in court. So the responses were uh, yes, uh, by uh, almost 60%. No, 36%. Prefer not to say 4.4. So uh, you can see by the consistency of the number of responses that uh, people um, went a long way towards filling the survey out and answering as many questions as possible. We wanted to, s to, to gauge uh, people's uh, reaction to the uh, 911 process, which uh, is a county contract uh, and has been the subject of some controversy on and off over the years. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, the, s the stats that we get from the provider for the 911 service uh, are pretty impressive in terms of the response time, in terms of the majority of the vast majority of all calls are answered within uh, 15 to 20 seconds. So there seems to be um, an interesting response there. Have you ever called for assistance? Yes, so 35, no, 60, prefer not to say. Was your call handled properly and efficiently? 90%. So we're heartened, I think, by that, uh, by that outcome. And uh, after your call, did the OPP follow up or attend promptly? 84%. So that's, that's very, uh, 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 very good as well. Uh, this is a little pie chart in terms of uh, how much would you prefer to uh, see your taxis change. Uh, we see that small uh, 5.3 decrease there, uh, the large zero, uh, and the yes of 64 um, broken out into various, uh, various categories.
So that, that, uh, that gives us something to work with in terms of budget time and how much people are prepared to pay for that enhancement if we in, indeed decide to enhance our, uh, our uh, police service. So uh, one thing that we, we have done as a task force and done as a council is to write to the Chief Justice requesting that they examine uh, and p increase the set fines for speeding. And the set fines for speeding are basically the fines that uh, run, a, uh, run a from uh, one kilometer per hour over up to uh, 50 kilometers per hour, uh, after which and, and possibly at which a stunt driving charge could uh, could be laid. Uh, these fines have not been increased in probably 30 or 35 years. It's a bit of a joke. And um, we, uh, we think that uh, while not the, uh, not the uh, total solution to uh, speeding issues, as part of a package it would send a very strong message to speeders if all of a sudden they were being uh, fined more for their um, behavior. Uh, and uh, the Chief Justice wrote back and said, yes, I do set the fines, but I take the advice of the uh, Minister of Transportation. So we've included this slide and we will have it on our website, how you can uh, lobby both the Minister of Transportation, Caroline Mulroney, and the Solicitor General, Sylvia Jones, local MPP, uh, as well as uh, their staff uh, to increase those fines. I had a meeting with, uh, with Sylvia Jones yesterday to uh, to lobby uh, for an increase in fines. And uh, I can't uh, really say that it went um, enthusiastically well. Um, one uh, possibility that she raised that I, I did have some issue with was uh, declaring various sections of road a community safety zone, which effectively doubles the fines. And I suggested to her that it would be rather ludicrous to uh, designate the entire stretch of, uh, of Fairport Road as an example as a community safety zone. Community safety zones were originally envisaged around hospitals, p um, parks, uh, in, uh, schools, that kind of thing. Uh, and municipalities, because they have the right to set them up uh, without exception, uh, have abused, uh, frankly, in my view, uh, the notion of a community safety zone when they've declared three quarters of the town uh, such a, a, an area. It is not a solution to our problem on Airport Road or, or Hockley Road, as an example. Although we do have a community safety zone outside of Mono Amaranth Public School. So, we now have Mike Walker, who's going to tell you a little bit about our policing contract, and I'll hand the uh, device over to you, Mike. I've been, I've been reminded to, uh, to tell you uh, that we are being recorded. So we do have uh, TV, uh, and we will be streaming this at some future point uh, on, uh, on YouTube, or making it available on YouTube. But we do record our council meetings, and we do record special meetings such as this, uh, so that people who can't uh, make it can actually watch it uh, uh, later on. Uh, I'm also reminded that we have fire exits in the rear of uh, the council chamber as well. <laughs> Thank you. Mike. And I see that Catherine and Linda have already noted that uh, I stole their uh, slide deck, or portions of their slide deck, the, the pretty picture parts anyway. Um, I'm, uh, as uh, uh, the uh, deputy mayor said, I'm the chair of the police board. So. My main job is uh, as a liaison uh, with the uh, town and the detachment commander uh, on all our day-to-day -day, um, operations. Uh, we don't tell the OPP what to do, but uh, we suggest what our goals and objectives are uh, as a town, and that's some of the things that uh, we're discussing here today. Let's see if I can make this work, okay. So, uh, once again, this is uh, straight out of the uh, OPP uh, slide deck, but just to, to, to let you know that the OPP uh, provide an adequate and effective policing uh, resource for us within our community. And they're, they're doing quite a few different things uh, and quite a few different things that other municipal police departments don't do, such as Shelburne or, or Orangeville, in that they're doing uh, quite a bit uh, more in the way of uh, air, air work, uh, search and rescue, 
and, and many other uh, things such as public order maintenance. Stuff that we don't need here in Mono and the good news is we're not directly paying for that in our billing project, contract. So what do we get for our money in Mono? That's uh, our, our famous uh, sign that uh, says OPP target area and uh, speed kills and uh, we have all kinds of different messaging that can be put on that that uh, John provides to the County of Dufferin on a regular basis. So uh, that uh, is part of our airport road messaging. And, and that's just another strategy that uh, we're, we're looking at. So the OPP budget, wow, freeze, stay. So the overall OPP budget is, is, is huge. It's you know, well over a, a billion dollars. And that's paying for quite a few different things. So there's all these provincial specialized responsibilities, traffic safety, investigations, intelligence, all these covert operations for organized crime. You know, all that's going on and it's being done by the Ontario Provincial Police. And then the specialized units, canine units, emergency uh, response teams, um, all the work that uh, is done with the uh, Aboriginal uh, folks in the north. So that's all part of the specialized responsibilities. Uh, in indigenous uh, policing, auxiliary policing, community safety. And the thing that we're paying for is the blue side, which is municipal policing resources. So that's only 35% of the budget. So the question is, what are we paying? So how the OPP work is they use something called a daily activity reporting system. So they're able to determine when they're working how they're allocating their hours. So if the officer, for example, is doing a report that's mono related, then the daily activity report will charge hours and time against this municipality. If they're up in uh, Mulmer, it's charged against Mulmer. If they're doing something that is more provincially uh, oriented, that doesn't fall under municipal, then it gets charged to that other 65% color that was in that chart. So they're able to track all this and figure out in a year what they've done. And everything has a, a time factor put to it. So if they say, it's like going for a break job. You, know, you go for a break job and they say it's four hours. You pay for four hours. So for us, if they say it's a break and enter investigation, it's four hours or three hours or two hours. If it's a traffic accident, so it's averaging. And that's how they figure out what we need to pay. So the billing model is calculated based on base services. So the base service for us that we're paying for here in Mono is $189.54 per household. And that's how it's worked out, it's per household. And that's calculated based on the, uh, you know, the entire overall picture of what the OPP are providing for that type of policing. So it's paying for the sergeants, the staff sergeants, inspectors, constables, the cruisers, all of that kind of stuff falls into base service. Then we get into calls for service. And that's where they take all of the time that's spent across the province on municipal policing and then they divide the hours and then they look at uh, what your municipality happens to be uh, uh, costing. So for us, for example, they'll look at all the B&Es, all the car accidents, and they'll come up with a number and that becomes our factor for calls for service and that's what we end up paying. Now on top of this is things like overtime, court, uh, court officers, everything like that that, that is uh, uh, ancillary to the, uh, the operation. So here's the numbers. So we have uh, 3,339 households within the town of Mono and we have 116 commercial and industrial facilities for a total of 3,455 um, properties. So we divide that into the, uh, what the OPP have figured is the base service, which is 654,861, and that gives us a cost of 189,54 per property. 
Then for calls for service, the total calls for service for all municipalities in the province is 156 million calls for service. Our portion of that, you know, once they go back to that daily activity report and see how many jobs that they've done in Mono, it works out that we're taking up 0.24% of the time. So we, def we do our gazintas, the 0.24% goes into the 156 and it comes up to 109.51. So that's what we're paying for calls for service. Add on to that overtime, which is 1222, and that could be because of, uh, uh, unfortunately, things like uh, homicide investigations or uh, river searches, that type of thing. Uh, prisoner transportation, and you see that one item is contract enhancements, and we'll talk about contract enhancements in a minute. So our total is $346.02 per household. So that's what you're paying for the OPP right now, and that's with an enhancement. So our contract enhancement, currently we have two thirds of an officer, or three quarters of an officer that we pay for as a contract enhancement. So what our base service gives us is, we call the police, the police come. What are they, what are they doing when they're not coming to us? They're doing traffic enforcement, they're patrolling, uh, they're doing things like that could be anywhere within the county, could be in Mono. But what the OPP will do is they, they assure us that they're able to respond and they do respond to calls for service. So our contract enhancement is uh, uh, an officer that some of you may have met if you were speeding, uh, Larry Matkowski, and uh, he's a retired Toronto police officer, yay. And um, what Larry does is uh, he goes out and 30 hours a week, he sets up in Mono for speeders. He also patrols in our, in our, in our subdivisions and basically shows the flag. Uh, and he does it very well. As, as the deputy mayor stated, the amount of, uh, of money that is made through the traffic enforcement comes back to the municipality. And I don't know how many tens of thousands of dollars that uh, flow back to the municipality because of Larry's enforcement. So that's an enhancement. So we're paying for Larry as, as over and above what is normally provided by the OPP. Now to give you some, uh, uh, an idea of how it's done elsewhere, uh, anybody drive south of Highway 9 down Highway 10 and see lots of OPP cruisers on Highway 10? That's in Caledon. So they have enhancements also. So they pay for 13 or 15? I don't know the Yeah, so they have, so that's over and above what base service would be. So they, they, they pay for that because they have a large, uh, large tax base there. What we also do here, in addition to that enhancement, we have $20,000 allocated in the budget for paid duty officers. So if we know that there's a problem, let's say there's a problem on, uh, in Fieldgate and we want to put uh, uh, some extra cruisers down in that area, we'll use our paid duty officers. So these are officers that are off duty that we're paying to come in for four to eight hours to do specified uh, tasks that the detachment commander determines. So if we know that we have a problem, then Staff Sergeant Randall will deploy the pay duty officers as a supplement to what we're already getting. So our cost for Larry, the, the uh, three quarters of an officer, is about $100,000. Now you say, yeah, he's not getting all that. That's, that pays for, for training, cruisers, uniforms, all that kind of stuff. Uh, a, the grossed up number for a full, full-time equivalent, part-time officer, is uh, something that I'll leave to, uh, to, to Catherine to talk about. So currently, that's what we're paying for. We're paying for that, uh, for $20,000 worth of pay duty and that enhanced officer, and it's costing us about $340,000 uh, $340 a household a year. Pretty good money, pretty good value, I would say. Is 
at this part by push to go forward. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice, but it's not one of my slides. Okay. Can we make that any bigger, Ben? Um, all right, I got the, the thankful task of doing the numbers, which I know can be kind of boring, so I'll, I'll try to be brief and, and give you the, the big picture on, on this uh, slide. If we could make it just a bit bigger, it would help. The, I got the data from <coughs> the county, um, Scott Burns, and uh, th I thank him for it. Now, I had the data in the form I got it. Th these are the, the, um, the cables or the wires you go over that they put on uh, 18 different sites on county roads in Mono, and from that, they're interested in traffic counts and, tra and traffic classifications, but you can calculate speeds. Uh, to do this, I did have to manipulate the data and then make the calculations, so if there's any errors in it, I'll take responsibility for that. What, what I'm showing in this slide are, are two numbers in pink and blue. The, the, the uh, blue is the percent of total traffic that was moving at 10 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. The pink, is it pink, mauve, whatever it is, is, the, per, is the, the percent of traffic that was moving at 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. There's a couple of, uh, you'll notice there's one observation site there where we couldn't make that calculation. So don't worry about those complications. Um, this slide was done up by Andrew of our staff and I thank him for that. And to simplify things in, in what I'm showing here, I, we, we reduced the 18 observation points down to 15. We combined a few, so we combined three points on Hockley Road there. So I'm, what I'm going to do now briefly is go through each of these roads one by one. And does this thing flash too? Okay, so the first one is County Road 8, which runs, it doesn't flash, the right button. Right. Oh, this button. So County Road 8 runs from Airport Road through Mono Center and and over to Highway 10. And we had three observation points there. Um, the, the speed limit is 80 kilometers an hour on the east end. It's 50 kilometers an hour going through the village. And then it's 60 kilometers an hour as you come out to Highway 10. Uh, about one fifth of the traffic on County Road 8, I'm combining all the numbers here, is traveling at 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. That's one fifth. So 20% of the drivers are doing at least 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. Um, as we approach Highway 10, the numbers are very low. I think that's because uh, you're approaching a flashing light and a, and a, a somewhat challenging uh, intersection. Now, County Road 10, which continues on to the west of uh, Highway 10, or, or sorry, uh, between Highway 10, yeah, um, where's County, County Road 10 is right, yeah, no, that's 16, T 10 is, 10 is right there, no, that's 15, 15. No, sorry, that's 15, oh yeah, right, there. sorry, there's County Road 10, okay, um, on County Road 10, uh, uh, there was only two observation points, and quite frankly, the, the traffic is pretty, is not many people are speeding on, on this County Road. 12% are traveling at 10 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit, and only 2.5% are traveling at, at 20 kilometers an hour over the speed limit. So now let's drop down to uh, County Road 16, which is the extension of Hockley Road right here. And we have three observation points. And this is quite interesting because um, when you start, the, the speed limit is um, uh, 60 kilometers an hour as you go through past those two subdivisions, Cardinal Woods and, and uh, Watermark. Uh, then it, it clicks up to, um, I'm going on memory here because I'm ahead of myself on my notes. But I think it's, it's 70 kilometers an hour by the time you get to the end. If I got that right, yes it is. Um, so, is it 60 at the end? Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, in total on County Road 16, we have 60% of the vehicles that are moving at 10 kilometers an hour with the speed limit. And right here between the two subdivisions where the speed limit is 50 kilometers an hour, we get some very high um, uh, rates of speed. Uh, and I think it's because the speed limit's posted so low there, but as, as you just leave those two subdivisions, 36% uh, of the vehicles are at 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. 
there, there is, uh, in, in these particular observation points, I can, I can get a bit more refined because it gives me the time of day. So l let me just give you one number here. Um, on the eastbound traffic, traveling be right between the two subdivisions in the morning hours, uh, fully two-thirds of the vehicles were traveling at 70 kilometers an hour or more. That's in a 50 kilometer an hour zone, two-thirds of the traffic. By the way, I should have said at the beginning, don't, I know these are a lot of numbers. If anyone's really into the numbers and wants the Excel spreadsheet, just send me an email and I'll send you the raw data. So don't, don't try to remember these numbers here. So now let's down, drop down to Hockley Road where I live. Let's uh, push this uh, button here. Is it flashing? No, red button. But I don't see any. Well, you, you all know where Hockley Road is. Um, we have five different observations uh, along Hockley Road. Uh, what we've combined some of them on this slide. Uh, the most easterly points, the speed limit is 70 kilometers an hour. That's from the village over to just past Airport Road. And in total at these three spots, um, one third of the traffic is moving at 10 kilometers an hour or more of the speed limit and 10% is traveling at 20 kilometers an hour of the speed limit. Moving to the west, this observation point right here before you get to Highway 10 is in front of a school zone or is in a school zone where the speed limit's 50 kilometers an hour. Um, one fifth of the vehicles, 19.6% as you can see up there, were moving at 10 kilometers an hour or more of the speed limit and 8% were moving at 20 kilometers an hour, that's 70 kilometers an hour or more uh, in front of a school. Now let's go to everyone's favorite road, Airport Road. Uh, we have seven locations where traffic was measured, but on the slide we've combined these to just six points to make it a bit simpler. At three of the seven locations, I can't calculate the traffic at 20 kilometers an hour or more because it just wasn't in the raw data. The, the most dr dr dramatic numbers here are south of the intersection of County Road 8, Mona Center Road, and Airport Road. At this point, the measurement is for southbound traffic only, uh, and fully 80, 79% um, of the track, 78.7, okay, 79% of the traffic is moving at 10 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit, and uh, um, in the speed limit there's 80 kilometers an hour, and 40% is moving at 20 kilometers an hour or more, so that's, that's 100 kilometers an hour they're doing, or more. That's, uh, um, 40% of the traffic is moving at 100 kilometers an hour or more south of uh, Mono Center Road. Combining all seven observation points uh, for Airport Road and making some adjustments for those ones where I couldn't do the calculations, um, we have two-thirds of the traffic on Airport Road is moving at 10 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit, and 22%, that's one out of every five cars, is moving at 20 kilometers an hour or more over the speed limit. All right, I, I know that's a lot, lot of numbers, and it, you'll never remember them all. Let, let me, how, how do I make the next slide go, Fred? Do I push this button? So, so I'll just... Yeah, the next slide. So here, what I've done is I've combined all data from all 18 observation points. So in total, for the three-year period between 2016 and 2019, we have 26,000 vehicles that were captured. Um, over half, 56%, were 10 kilometers an hour over the speed limit, and one quarter... Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Ross. I am a sergeant with the Municipal Policing Bureau of the Ontario Provincial Police. I have been asked to speak briefly about enhancements. So what I'd like to touch on this evening is what an enhancement is, what they're used for, and the process involved for a municipality to obtain an enhancement. I would also like to briefly cover the enhancement service you currently have, as well as an overview of the cost to implement a new enhancement. Before we head into these topics, I just want to make a brief note that the OPP does provide adequate and effective policing, as set out in the Police Services Act. 
This includes, as previously mentioned, and I'll recap, crime prevention, law enforcement, assistance to victims of crime, public order maintenance, and emergency response. Whether a municipality is policed by the OPP under a contract or a non-contract, the service is the same. An enhancement is available to municipalities policed under a contract and is an additional resource over and above the detachment complement that provides a dedicated and specific function at the municipality's request and expense. An enhancement position is not necessarily attached to a person, but rather a set number of service hours. The commitment from the OPP for a full-time enhancement is 1,417 hours a year. Most commonly, enhancements are utilized as dedicated community services officers, better known as school officers, and I will shorten that for my purposes to CSOs, or a, dedica or a dedicated a traffic enforcement officer. The OPP's base services do include community services officers or CSOs, but they do not necessarily spend 100% of their time strictly performing this function for a specific school or municipality. Traffic enforcement is also already provided, but some municipalities prefer a dedicated resource working at specific locations within the municipality. So briefly, just to recap on the current services, as you're aware, Mono currently has a part-time traffic enforcement officer as an enhancement. He does police part-time and represents that 0.75 that we saw on the slide of an FTE or full-time equivalent and gives around 1,000 hours of service. His dedicated purpose is traffic safety on mono roads, such as Airport Road and Hockley Road. He work, works a variety of dates and times and locations that suit your needs. The cost for Mono's enhancement is approximately $95,000. So to elaborate on the cost, if Mono hired a new full-time uniform enhancement, the cost would be approximately $170,000. If Mono hired a new part-time uniform enhancement, the cost would be approximately $130,000. The main difference between that part-time enhancement constable and the regular full-time is pay and benefits. So, just touching on the process, if the decision was made uh, at the local level that an enhancement is the best option to proceed with, the municipality needs to consider the specific dedicated purpose that en the enhancement is to perform in consultation with the detachment commander. A formal request is made to the detachment commander, in this case, uh, Staff Sergeant Nicole Randall. This can simply be in the form of an email. The staff sergeant would then make two written notifications, one to Central Region Command and one to our Bureau. If the enhancement is supported at the regional level, then the Municipal Policing Bureau will consult with Provincial Command. The cost estimate could slightly change depending on the salaries and the benefit uh, rates in effect at the time that employee was to be was hired and it is prorated for the period left in the calendar year it can take some time to complete a job advertisement to advertise to do an interview a background check and of course hire and then train Municipal Policing Bureau would then prepare a contract proposal, including the requested enhancement, and present it to the municipality. So I hope that this information has been helpful uh, in assisting Mono moving forward with a decision regarding the unique policing needs of your community.
Catherine, just, I just want to check one thing. So we, we could ask for an enhancement and we would specify some duty, presumably traffic, but is it not true that in, in addition to the base policing we get and, and the enhanced service we get, occasionally we do get help from central region? I mean, don't they, isn't that what has been working on airport road this year? Like, like and I, so how many hours of that do we get a year? I mean, I, I know it wasn't your detachment, uh, Nikki, that was doing all the, the, catching all the stunt drivers in airport road. I, is that something that, does that come regularly every year? Are we gonna get so many hours from central region to do these, these blitzes? Um, it is a regular thing. So Central Region has a traffic team as part of the Provincial Traffic Office, which is form known as the PTO. And there's a team that operates out of Barrie, one operates out of Aurelia, and one operates out of uh, over further east, um, Halliburton, somewhere up on that side. They are required to spend a certain amount of time in each municipality to support the municipalities. So for example, right now uh, we have the commercial motor vehicle enforcement uh, activity going on this week. I have Mark Gagnon with me uh, for the summer. He's been assigned to Dufferin Detachment and his specialty is commercial motor vehicles. So earlier in the year, we were having such significant issues on airport road. I reached out to the provincial traffic office and said, I need some help. We need to do something. So the team was assigned down here and continues to be assigned down here on a regular basis, uh, two officers minimum, and they spend uh, their shifts, so they're on what's called a 223. So they may come down for two 12-hour shifts, so uh, 48 hours of enforcement. But as I said, they're split up amongst the region, so they also go to Caledon, or they go to uh, Collingwood, or to Midland, whoever's on our side in our little pocket. Helpful? Question ahead for you, Catherine. When you say that we could get a new part-time enhancement officer for $130,000, so how many hours is that a year? But it's still $130,000. I believe that, uh, that calculation was based on the 0.75, uh, and it was an initial startup cost of what we need for them to be not operable. So it would be another 0.75 officer. I believe so. Any other questions? Here? All right, prices are going up. <laughs> Sorry, just to understand. So we're getting an enhancement now, 0 0.75 at 90,000. And then I think you said for another 0 0.75, it'd be 130,000, but that, so can you just clarify that? Inflation. So we can certainly clarify numbers. I was giving ballparks. There has been a rate increase uh, for salaries and benefits in our settled contract. There is also startup costs associated with a new enhancement. So I could provide those numbers to you in a broken down measurement, um, if so requested. Yeah, Don, I think w what happens is this is a uh, a person that's being brought in, so they have to they have to go through training. They have to have their initial uh, kit of equipment. <coughs> so that that's all part of the startup cost. So that that's quite easily uh, thirty thousand over. Uh, the basic salary. I would imagine that in, in subsequent years that, that the rate would be back down to the same amount that we're currently paying our, our, our 0.75. This is a bit off the wall, but in terms of enhancements, we, we are in the process, we in the town of Mona, of developing a particular park. And it, it's going to go ahead and the majority of residents there want the park, but we do get some complaints. And one of them is if we put these facilities in the park and we put a parking lot, and this is inside the roads, okay? Mm -hmm. So you, you can't drive a car in there. Is it possible to get, a par as part of, say, additional enhancement, some level of commitment that the OPP would do a foot patrol two or three times during the summer? The, the allegations I'm getting from some people is, oh, the kids are back there and they're doing drug deals. No, no, these are allegations, okay? I have no idea about them veracity of these these claims but just in terms of satisfying our residents that we're we're doing things could we how do we get policing in a park where there's no road so there's two options the first option is uh, we get the complaints we get ongoing complaints about the issue so we specifically assign the patrol officers 
out on foot, two of you together, always has to be two, into the park during the target hours, right? How we get our target hours is the number of complaints we have. We narrow down the times that these offenses are happening and when the most uh, common time is, and then we send the officers in during that point. The other option is to have your enhancement. If you have the enhancement, you hire an enhancement for the jobs you want them to do. So you hire them to do traffic enforcement, you hire them to do school resource officer, or you hire them to be out and be visible and do foot patrol. If you only have one enhancement and you want foot patrol included in it, then that's up to me to make sure that the enhancement has a backup officer with them. We would very rarely have uh, two, uh, one officer out on foot patrol. It would only be in a highly populated area where they would be by themselves. Into a back park where there's no road, you would have to have two. But that would be up to me. Once you told me this is what you want, that would be up to, make, to me to make sure that he's got backup. And, and uh, to clarify, um, this could also be addressed uh, with uh, a paid duty officer, an officer or officers uh, on occasion as directed? Correct, and it's uh, the same as the money that is allocated to the detachment for paid duties is being used right now. It's being used for traffic enforcement, it's being used for high visibility enforcement, it's being used to try and combat some of the issues that we're finding during different times of the day. So we target it where we need it. Any other questions? Yeah, I just want to point out that uh, on the traveling 20 kilometers an hour post the speed limit, the emphasis here is more, 20 or more, because 20 is almost acceptable on airport road. I live on airport road. Anyone else? Yes, and, and, and I mean, it's, it's not inconceivable that we can't get finer uh, detail from the stats that we've been given so that we can actually uh, uh, dissect the 25% uh, the uh, more, uh, more uh, closely to see whether it's 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers, whatever. Actually, we can't, Troy. You can't? Yeah. Okay. But it, it theor theoretically, we could, we could uh, obtain that information by other means. I'm sure that we could if we if we needed to, needed to, but suffice to say, I, I think these numbers are quite dramatic, and um, as Dell says, the emphasis is on the word more, uh, because I think people who have the experience uh, and as we saw in the re returns on our survey, uh, people have been affected. Ni almost 90 percent of the respondents say they have been affected in one way or another by aggressive driving, uh, and I th I'm sure that everybody in this room is. Uh, it's probably higher than 90 percent. <laughs> Anyways, uh, that that uh, brings to a conclusion uh, our um, formal presentations. Uh, we wanted to sort of set the table for for you, the audience, to uh, uh, to uh, come to the microphone, uh, make points, uh, ask questions, uh, and we'll do our best to answer those <laughs> questions. And then uh, uh, at the conclusion, uh, we'll try and give you some indication of where we go from here. But uh, there will be a report and recommendation is plural uh, to council, not uh, only on the issue of enhancements, but on the issue of things that we might be able to do as a community to uh, get this problem under control. Come on forward. And if, you, if, if people could state their names and, and uh, if, if possible, where they live. Ed Craker, and we live in between 15th and 20th side road on airport road, so uh, we're in that high stat area, and I can verify those numbers are correct. <laughs> Not that I have a, a, a device for measuring it, but I see it and we hear it. Um, I, a couple of things, I have a question. When uh, was that data collected? Um, and the reason I'm asking that question is, I know there's, and I appreciate that there's been increased police surveillance on airport road in the last 12 months plus. Has there been any notice, has there been any decrease in those numbers during that time? The, the, all, the 18 observation points were between 2016 and 2019. Only okay. one was a 2019 number, so there's no way it could address okay. the question since sure. this crackdown, whether it's had an effect. The other thing that I wanted to, the point I wanted to make is that I was, uh, I mean, even though I, <laughs> as you know, I, I, I came to council some time back and I used a statement, those of us who live on airport road live in a life and death situation. And that number uh, certainly testifies to it. Um, and when I look at all the statistics for 
the town of Mono, that area between 15th and 20th side road is so high that I think it warrants a separate study on why is this happening and what can we do to, to slow the traffic in that section. I have a, I have a, <clears throat> a thought on it, I was thinking about it this evening. One of the things is just south of 15th side road, we have a lot of steep hills. We've got Hockley Valley. North of 20th, we've got more steep hills getting into 25th and 30th. I think people are speeding in that section in between to try and get ahead of the traffic. And one of, one of, the, one of those groups of traffic is big trucks, and that's another issue that I've got, is a number of trucks on Airport Road, and it's not a road that's designed to carry trucks by any means, but traffic, I think, is using that stretch to try and get ahead of everybody else. Um, but I think, I just want to propose that we have a separate study on why that section between 15th and 20th is such a high statistic, and secondly, what can we do to change that statistic. I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of a special study, but how, how would you do it? I mean, stop every car that's going over the speed limit and ask them why? I, I'm just not quite sure, Ed, how... Well, how I don't have it. an answer to that now either, but I think I'm suggesting that we uh, you know, have, a, have a group of people that do some brainstorming on the whole issue. I, I said, I, I have... My own this suggestion, it's one reason I think it could be happening is because both north and south of that section, there are major hills. And, and you know, we find, for example, not only is speed an issue in that section, we're, we've found ourselves many times hitting the brakes and hitting the shoulder because we're coming up to, a, to a, a ridge and there's a car passing on the other side of the ridge. I mean, that's common in that section of Airport Road and it's people that are crazily trying to get ahead of the traffic, either to get up to cottage country or get down to Toronto. And they know the road, they've traveled it often enough that they know they're, cu they're coming up to some big hills where they're not going to be able to pass, the trucks are crawling. So let's get ahead of everybody as fast as we can. Ed, uh, I think you make some good points. I'm just going to extend a general invitation to our representatives from the OPP to jump in at any point uh, to make any observations you'd like with regard to the questions and the answers that, uh, that we're providing uh, and uh, maybe speak to the issue of uh, whether the uh, crackdown, and I think it can be characterized as a crackdown that has occurred, uh, is bearing fruit. Um, my sense is that you are having an impact, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, in fairness, uh, at any point, if you feel that you need to make a, an observation or correct the record, please feel free to do so. Uh, to that end, Fred, uh, Ed, you make a point about the uh, the truck traffic, and, and uh, Nikki Randall Randall's mentioned that uh, she has somebody who's a specialist in uh, in truck enforcement. The county has purchased uh, portable way scales uh, that it uh, makes available to the OPP for purposes of, of truck enforcement, and uh, they basically determine that uh, trucks that are too heavy. Uh, for our roads, b both in terms of the impact on the roads, but also from the standpoint of the speed at which they may be traveling and the safety uh, that they may or may not be observing uh, it comes into play. So when a truck is stopped, and it may be stopped for speeding, uh, those weigh skills will also be used to determine the weight of the vehicle and whether or not it is overloaded. I think that's a fair uh, assessment. Any other questions? Paul. Hi, good evening. Paul Seymour. I live on the first line. Uh, first and foremost, I'm, this is great. Great to see. Appreciate the effort. Uh, a couple comments, and I have a couple questions for the officers here tonight. Um, you're right, Councillor Nix. We do have a speeding problem on first line. What we've observed is it's two things. It's people trying to head northbound on first line. They get to the end, they realize it's a dead zone. It's the lake. They turn around. I think out of frustration, they gun it to head back to Highway 9. At one time, we had a dead end sign. I'm not sure what happened to it with all the community signs. Maybe it's been removed. Um, I've checked three times in the last 24 hours. I, I, I don't see one. That might help. The second offender seemed to be the car dealerships using it as a test track. Honda specifically, I hate to pick on brands, but they seem to be most, most common. Maybe a quick knock on the door there would help. As it relates to the park, um, just in the last week, two separate incidents that I'm aware of. Um, last week, 
Four carloads of young people entering the park at 11.30 at night, partying on the bridge till after one in the morning. No one said they're doing drug deals. We don't know what they're doing. Point is, they're not supposed to be there. Second issue was Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m. A car actually opened the gate, entered the park, drove in, way past down the end, beyond my sight line, towards. No, the gate uh, actually entered the park. They lift the pin, they open the gate, they drove in, there were kids playing at the park, they drove all the way down the field to the end, and were there for maybe half an hour. I phoned that one in, which leads me to my two questions. The officers we engaged on the road ask us to phone in regularly and report these issues, which is great, so the, the street, we've been actively doing that. What we don't get is feedback or the results and the second question is that it relates to safety and security. The current parking lot is visible from the first line. The current proposed parking lot coming up is proposed to go behind the houses out of the sideline of first line. I'd like to get the officer's opinion whether or not that makes sense from a safety and security perspective. You spoke so fast, Sorry. I'm still breaking down. <laughs> <laughs> two, two, two issues. Um, the park, so when we call and we report the issues, there's no closure. We don't know what's been done. No one ever calls back and says, we chased them down, we caught them, they got a ticket, mm -hmm. didn't find them, whatever. So we'd like to know what happens after we report the issues. And the second is the proposed parking in the new parking lot is going to be behind, out of your sight line or first line. We want to know what your opinion is from a safety and security perspective. Uh, well, I can, is this on? Mm -hmm. I can start with um, the kids in the park and going into the park and not getting any feedback. You can specifically ask for a call back from the officer. The officer will do their best to call you back depending on the time of day and where they get called to next. Sometimes they'll go to your call and they'll go to another call, another call, another call, and then it's two or three in the morning and they don't want to call you back. I can speak to, I think, the incident this weekend and the officers did locate them and they were said that they were dropping off their coolers for a party later and subsequently they never came back for the party. But um, if you ask specifically for feedback as to what happened, the officers will do the best to contact you back. So just a supplemental. Just begin in the microphone. If they were dropping off their coolers but they were driving in an area where cars aren't supposed to go, how is the cooler commentary relevant? They still drove where kids are playing in the park. Okay, so I may have the wrong occurrence? No, that, you're absolutely right, because that's what they told us, too. We, we actually said to them, hey, guys, you can't drive here. There's kids playing. It's a park. And they said, we're just dropping our coolers off. And about 20 minutes later, they drove away, and we never saw them again. Yeah. So y the story's a lie. Yeah. Okay. But it's still an infraction, is it not? To drive through there? Uh, no. It's off a highway. There isn't really much I can do. So you're allowed to drive a motorized vehicle in the park where young children play, at behind the parkette? To the best of my knowledge, uh, I don't think we have a bylaw that controls that. I mean, it, it, we, maybe we should, but uh, yeah. to the best of my knowledge, uh, there's no current bylaw. I'll leave that to you guys, but I, that would be probably a good sure idea. I'm pretty sure the Town of Mono Parks bylaw does restrict all motorized vehicles that are unauthorized. Now, that is an old, I believe, uh, mid-90s bylaw. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then your next point is the parking, the parking lot. lot. They're proposing to move it behind maybe the third or fourth house down yep. out of the sight line of first line, and we're just wondering what your perspective is in terms of safety and security. Well, who's safety and security? As opposed to, like, is there going to be people parking there late at night or people walking through the park? Or are you talking about personal safety, talking about dangerous driving in the park? Like, if, as long as the parking lot is uh, lit for night parking or access controlled, then, you know, I, I don't know, I don't really know what to say. To so you. when you're patrolling first line now, the officer can look to their left, see if there's cars in the parking lot after hours when you shouldn't really be there. There's no reason to park at 11 o'clock at night. The park's closed, CBC's closed. If they're parked at the parking lot where it's proposed to be moved, you will not be able to see that without actually leaving first line. We see it as a problem. I just wanted to get your opinion. Yeah, and it's fair. I, from your perspective, I can see how you see it's a problem. I, I suspect that the officers would just drive in then and have a look around. I know in, from my perspective, when I want to see what's going on in the parking lot, I drive in. Right? So if I know that there's, that's an issue area, then I'm going to make that effort to turn off and go back into the parking lot. I, I don't know anything about the parking lot. I don't know if it's planned to be lit at night or if it's planned to be a gated parking lot. These are all like very good questions as well, right? Thanks. Hi, 
I'm uh, Stephen Russell. I live uh, on French Drive in uh, Fieldstone Subdivision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess you're all aware we've got a pretty bad speeding problem on French Drive. Uh, this gentleman here lives around the corner on First Line. It's just as bad. We go for walks in the neighborhood, and it's, it's the Wild West there. So I'm just wondering, uh, don't see too many police officers, no speed, no uh, speed traps, nothing. So I'm just wondering if we can hand out a few tickets maybe or get a th couple three-way stops or just uh, speed bumps, anything to slow things down. I th we, I th we did I put a, a, a yeah, that's a, that's up. Which, uh, quite frankly, I drove through it yesterday and didn't seem to be working. But no, it's it's working. <laughs> oh. And but, I um, think, in fairness, there has been some uh, presence down there recently. Yeah. Uh, I know that uh, a number of people were charged uh, blowing through the stop sign. Uh, the reason we know is they phoned the municipal office to complain. Yeah, no, there we live two two houses away from Anderson, and not one car stops at that stop sign. Not one maybe two or three out of 10 slow down. So it's, uh, it's, it's a wild west there. I've never seen anything like it. Is that a, a community safety zone? I believe it, it is a community yeah. safety zone. Okay, well the fines will double for, for blowing through the stop sign. Yeah, but the, that's only, but uh, mm -hmm. the speed, um, I don't see anybody on the weekends there. Uh, apparently people in our neighborhood have a lot of money to buy very fast cars and they like to uh, use them on the Saturdays and Sundays and I don't see any police presence on the weekend at all. And I don't, uh, between 4.30 and 7 o'clock in the evening, again, coming home from work, again, no police presence at that time. Like, I don't know when the, the police come to do their speed traps, but it's not, it's not at the times I think they need to come. To, to the issue of the first line, uh, I think we will, we will have a little chat with the car dealerships once again yeah. uh, to remind them that, uh, that that is not a, a test track. Uh, to the issue of uh, French, uh, French Drive and uh, uh, vehicular traffic coming from the uh, coal subdivision, which is of concern as well, truck traffic especially, uh, I'd point out that uh, the town has been trying very hard to get uh, MTO to allow us to invest in a, a stop stoplight at second line in Highway 9. And uh, I think we were prepared to do it, uh, but in a recent letter from the former Minister of Transportation, he basically said that's just not necessary. So once again, we're up against, uh, you know, some uh, group of bureaucrats, uh, this time in the Toronto region of MTO, who uh, don't see it quite the way that our local residents do. And we will continue to lobby for uh, stoplights at, at second, which hopefully will relieve some of the traffic that you're experiencing on but, French. But my argument would be, I don't know when that coal subdivision was built, let's say 20, 25 years, yes. for argument's sake. So what did they do before Fieldstone was built? They didn't drive through a farmer's field. That's I mean, that, that road is there specifically for the subdivision, and there's absolutely no need to have 18 wheelers driving up and down that road. Uh, we just recently passed the truck bylaw. That, yeah. that, which doesn't doesn't totally prevent a truck from going down French Drive, it because the bylaw would allow if the destination if the destination was down there, the truck could actually drive the road. But if it wasn't, if they were trying to get to Colt Subdivision and from the east part of Highway Nine, they'd have to turn on the second line to get there. Yes, but the problem uh, I did write an email to Mike Dunmore. I believe was that his name. Yeah. So first line's not designed for trucks. I mean that three-way stop at French and First Line, they're up onto the sidewalk. I mean, they can't possibly or physically make that turn. So they're up onto the sidewalk. They're, if there's a car park there, they're, so the, the, you have a sign, no truck sign, just past the Toyota dealership parking lot. That needs to be out at Highway 9. Like, give the trucker a chance, because once he's on First Line, he's out of luck. He either goes down that's, to that's the dead end point. and turns around, or he comes through the, through the residential. I, I would also point out, Stephen, since, since I've been on council, but Long, well, John was on long before me, but it took us three years uh, of arguing with the MTO to get the trap. Yeah. Yeah, first line, three years before, never, I, I don't know how long you've lived there, but or right from you, the start, you could not turn from first. No, line I understand. On I understand nine. that. Yeah. But it took us three years to get MTO to yeah. listen to us. So on second line, and I, I have no idea how long it's going to take. But there still should be no reason to drive trucks through there because, it's, like I said, for 23 years they went the other way. Well, I'd, all, I'd be all in favor of letting all, all of the industrial users of French Drive know that 
that he's not a truck route. Now that they can't necessarily control some of the, the deliveries that they get or some of the trucks that yeah. that, that uh, bring supplies in and so forth, but I think they should all be aware uh, yeah. that that is not a shortcut and that they should be coming in and, uh, off the second and, line. And who do uh, who does the? I've, I've stopped a couple of truckers. And it's, I'm, I'm not yelling at them, but the guy says, "Well, I'm a local delivery." Well, his local delivery's on coals. So he sees a sign that says truck, no trucks, local delivery only. His address is on French Drive. He turns on to French Drive, but he really shouldn't be in the subdivision. This is actually, so, strictly speaking, a tricky legal issue tricky. because if you're coming from the west and a truck did turn on First Line and then on French Drive, and if he was ever charged, and Nikki, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just making this up, but I, I've been in similar situations. I think it would be very difficult to prove legally that he wasn't taking the shortest route to his destination. And our bylaw might, at that point, get shot down, okay? But I, I'm, I'm not, not saying it would, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just saying I know when we introduced the bylaw, we discussed this, and we got our fingers crossed that it works. But I had a, my suggestion was, if you put a sign right at the corner of Highway 9 in front and uh, first line, and put commercial traffic, please use, or commercial traffic use second line, no trucks, but that sign that's uh, 50 yards down the road is pretty much useless. They're already on first line. I think, it's, I think that's a good idea. We'll follow up on that. So, and then getting back to the speeding, I just, that's, it's bad. That's all I can say. Yeah. That whole first line, mm -hmm. French drive, it's bad. Okay. Nikki, Nikki do you have a, a comment? Yeah, so for the, for the speeding on French and first, I'll address it with the officers again. Yeah. I know that they have been down here, down there, and they have tried to set up enforcement for speeding specifically. Yeah and they're, they're not noticing a huge trend. The stop sign is definitely an issue. Uh, in speaking about the sign on Highway 10, I had a conversation with Mike Dunmore last year about that sign. He tried very hard to get a sign and the ministry will not permit us to put a sign there. On Highway 9, Highway 9 yeah. yeah. Is that was we'll exactly what we said? the ministry yeah. again. I, I appreciate what's been done so far with the truck signs. It has improved, the trucks. It's definitely improved. Yeah, oh, okay. Prob probably seventy percent improvement, but we're still getting, still getting quite a few. And uh, what do we do about school buses? They go flying down that road. That's a school bus company. Not necessarily yeah. carrying children. Yeah, they're empty. They're empty. They're heading to wherever in the town they, or whatever to. Is there a bus? Uh, is a there bus a bus company? On company? What company is it? Uh, first student. Anyway, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Come on forward. Uh. Hello, Dana and Paul Webster. We're on Fourth Line, just north of Fifth Side Road. Um, so Fourth Line, Fifth Side Road, and Fourth Line intersection is a nightmare in terms of stop sign because no one bothers to stop there. Um, Fifth Line is a nightmare. Hockley Road onto Fifth Side Road is a nightmare. I meant to say Fifth Side Road. Um, people pass us on the Hockley Road in front of the school, um, the, east, the one that's east of uh, 10. People will pass us uh, on there because we're going 50. Um, I'm also Airport Road. We've just, any, when we, Fifth Line, Airport Road, we sometimes turn south to go to nine, and there are often people passing at that point going north on the southbound lane. So it's, excuse, please excuse the French, but it's a real mind fuck when there's two people going in that direction and you want to turn this way. Um, plus just crossing the road is impossible. We will not drive north on, on Airport Road. We have completely stopped driving north on Airport Road from Fifth Side Road because it's so dangerous. I know everyone here can attest to that. Um, I, I, what I don't know is who manages Airport Road, and I really appreciate that the OPP do what the OPP do. Um, always appreciate seeing them, but clearly they can't be everywhere all the time. Um, and this is a serious issue everywhere we drive in Mono, Caledon, Highway 10, Highway 9. Um, so uh, is this just a conversation this evening around what the OPP can do for us, or are we also entertaining other ideas, someone suggested speed bumps, I don't know, cameras, like are, are we also talking about other issues that we can, or other w solutions um, to the problem other than just sort of catching people who are speeding? Because a absolutely, and, and, okay. and uh, 
uh, airport road as uh, Hockley Road, they're both county roads. So I'm a county councillor. I can okay. go back and, and make representations uh, to the county with regard to what the steps they could take. Uh, but you mentioned the interesting word camera. Uh -huh. And I wanted to ask whether people have an appetite to see the return of photo radar, speed radar. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, I, I'm of the view that when we had it in the 1990s, it was abused. It was used basically to capture as much money as possible, and they were sending out uh, uh, check, uh, sending out invoices to people for speeding five over the speed right. limit. If it were confined to the egregious speeds, uh, and basically regarded as a sort of a sin tax, mm -hmm. uh, I think that it would be better better applied, number one, and uh, better received. And if I were driving on a road and I knew there was a photo radar on that road, uh, mm -hmm. I would moderate my behavior. Mm -hmm. um, I would point out that there are no points uh, attributable uh, to a photo radar charge. Um, it is, mm -hmm. uh, it's just a straight fine. And personally, if we ever went that direction, uh, and there are municipalities that are looking at that, Toronto being one, Oakville being another, in community safety zones, such as schools, uh, but not necessarily in high-speed areas, although they have high speed in those areas, in, in Toronto at least, uh, they, uh, they are looking at um, uh, the charge being an administrative penalty as opposed to a charge before the court so that our courts would not get plugged, uh, uh, plugged up with, uh, with photo radar trials, and I would be in favor of that. Mm -hmm. Administrative penalties are very effective when they uh, are uh, involving uh, camera evidence, such as parking, mm -hmm. uh, such as anything else uh, that, uh, uh, that can be captured, and it's indisputable. I mean, you're either parking there or you're not. Yeah. So we have, we've seen that the the freeing up of thousands of hours of court time by taking parking uh, infractions out of the court uh, POA system and making them an administrative penalties. And I think that uh, mm -hmm. uh, this has promise in the area of photo radar. I just mm -hmm. throw that out. Uh, well, I think, it's a, I think it's a great idea because people are dying. Like people are literally dying on our roads. Um, there's always an, there's an accident. There's always an accident. And um, anyway, I'll get off. But it's it's really sc it's really scary out there. Speed bumps. And I just want you to know that that is something we have considered in the past, uh, not on a formal council level. But I've had several long arguments with our director of public works, and I've lost every one of them so far. The the speed bumps, the, if if we were to put them in, our snow plows cannot uh, accommodate mm -hmm. them. So we'd have to put the ones in that you put in in the spring mm -hmm. and then take out in the fall. And apparently every time you do that, you're putting a hole into our asphalt and our base and our, well, as I say, I've lost the argument with our director of public works yeah. several times on that. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I'm just hoping we're, that we're looking at other solutions besides just relying on our OPP. Thank you. And excuse the French. <laughs> just uh, quickly, uh, I know Staff Sergeant Randall has been meeting on a regular basis with the county discussing traffic calming, road design, all kinds of the issues that would help to reduce this uh, carnage that's uh, going on on the roads. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a big battle and uh, Nikki's fighting it for us at the county on a regular basis. And just another point about uh, the, uh, the visibility. You, you don't see the police cars down in, in your, your area. Um, a lot of the cars they're driving are unmarked, so if you see the one that uh, the staff are just driving today, you wouldn't know it's a, an OPP cruiser. So that's the type of surreptitious vehicles that they're driving, uh, and, and people don't know that the that, that uh, Dodge Charger that's driving up the street is in fact an OPP cruiser. Uh, you know, guys like me can spot them a mile away, but uh, most, most folks uh, can't tell the difference. So. Yeah, you, you might not, you know, it'd be nice if they were all driving around in the black and whites, but there's, you don't catch break and enters uh, driving uh, black and white cars too. So there, there, there is a reason that you're maybe not seeing them, but they are there. And I'm not their apologist. Uh, 
Uh, Michael Langs, my name. I live on <clears throat> here Ontario Street. Been a resident for 40 years almost. Uh, with regards to the speeding buses, it's quite simple. Uh, just take the time and the date of the occurrence. Phone the bus company. They track the buses with satellite, and they keep a record in their computer in their office. And then they call the driver in. And believe me, it works. But you, you just, you know, it's citizen involvement, you know, and it, it really, really works. So um, <clears throat> with regards to uh, speed, my feeling is that education is where everything starts and must start. So I believe that <clears throat> any money that we do have, I would like to see it go into a form of education, as we've done with uh, uh, substances like alcohol and drugs. Try to educate the pub public that you know, speed is not good for us. Um, <clears throat> I like electronic signs, and they're getting better and better. And I'm like everybody else. I try to do the speed limit, but occasionally I catch myself over the speed limit. <clears throat> then you see one of those signs, and they're getting better, where they're saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. And it just it sends such a message to you. And automatically, <clears throat> most citizens will slow down. Um, cameras, they're incredibly effective. I like your idea. You know, don't nail the person that's doing 5K over the speed limit. But they're incredibly effective, and they're cheap. Just mail a ticket, preset, no court. Very, very effective. Um, particularly in a zone like the Monoam School, and you pointed that out, it's a really bad zone. Put a camera in there, I'd say for sure. Airport Road, I think that would be a heck of a way of maybe getting some control over the speeding there. And some of the points that Ed made, I, I think, are very, very valid. but. I have another theory, and that's that people automatically know that it takes a lot of energy to climb that hill, and they try to build up inertia with speed. I don't know. I, I, it just seems that that's another possibility. You know, it, it, you know. Um, it's not a valid one, though, because they're exceeding the speed limit, and that's dangerous. Um, the ultimate solution is speed control in our vehicles by satellite. Now, if the bus company can track their buses and keep a record in their computer, we can all be tracked by satellite. And maybe we're going to just have to start ticketing via satellite. Now, it sounds a little bit maybe into the future, but it really isn't. Technology is moving ahead so rapidly, I just encourage council and the citizens of Mono to embrace uh, technological enhancements wherever we can, wherever they're practical. Um, eventually, our cars will be autonomous. We won't be driving them. We won't have driver's licenses. They'll be controlled by satellite anyways, and they'll, they'll do the speed limit, and that's it. Um, with regards to other suggestions about how can we control speed, there's a very, very simple <clears throat> initial capital costs may be high, but the maintenance costs are extremely low, and that's the use of traffic circles. They're used extensively in some countries around the world, not in Canada, other than in the city of Edmonton, but I see a lot of them coming into the uh, Kitchener area now, and they are very common in Germany. They really slow traffic down. I mean, you literally have to slow down to go through a traffic circle. Yes, it takes a little bit of coordination, but again, that's education. They're, they don't take any electricity. They don't take much maintenance. You don't need poles. Some of the intersections around Orangeville, I've actually stopped and taken pictures. There's eight poles around some of our intersections. When you come out of the Orangeville Mall, just stop there and take a picture of the poles. What about the cost? What about the cost? What about thinking about going green? Traffic circles are very, very environmentally green. 
I'm suggesting we start considering those things. We just spent 22 million to fix up Highway 10 between Orangeville and Shelburne, but we didn't put in one traffic circle. Camilla, it's a, it's, it's a horrible, horrible intersection. It scares the daylights out of me. I have to go through it a lot. And it, it's just a very, very, very unsafe place. That would have been a perfect spot for a traffic circle. Um, I would like to suggest also that we do be mindful of taxes. Um, since I've lived here, my taxes have gone up almost sixfold. My um, inflation has not gone up that much. Maybe double, but not sixfold. So any money we spend, I'd like to see us being very mindful of what we do spend and how we spend it. And another thing too that I haven't heard much of in the last 10 or 15 or 20 years is a thing called neighborhood watch. And yet 20 years ago, it was more common. So instead of reaching into our pockets to write a bigger uh, property tax check, why don't we get back to some volunteerism and get into, back into Neighborhood Watch. Almost everybody carries one of these. You can download an app now, a radar app, and I've gone out on my road because I live on a gravel road with idiot speeders, and you just stand out there with your phone, and I'm telling you, people get the message. They start slowing down. They wonder what you're doing. Well, you're taking their picture of their car, their license plate, and their speed. It's great evidence. So, well, I wouldn't say it's radar, but it's tech. Pardon me? Oh, it's the magic of technology. It's algorithms, algorithms that are written to measure the velocity of an object coming at you. You don't need radar to do that. No, no, it's, you know, these things are in incredibly powerful tools, and we all have them in our hands. Incredibly powerful. Um, from the slides tonight, it seems as though the majority of the citizens in Mono are reasonably happy. I am with the police services. I think they're, they've done and they're doing a great job. I don't know what it would take to slow the traffic down on Airport Road. I mean, we just couldn't hire enough police to do that. On the road that I'm on, which is a gravel road, but it's one over from here Ontario Street, so it's an emergency detour route. So if there's an accident on Highway 10 and they use our road or the blind line, I'm telling you, it's quite a show. You know, you get transport trucks, Greyhound buses, and all the people that like doing 100, 120, they don't slow down on gravel roads. I don't know how you slow them down, how you control them. We don't have enough police to do all that. And I don't think another two police would, you know, you just can't spread them that thin. So we have to look at technology, I think, to overcome some of these problems. Just, just, in, follow, just following up on, on, on that point, uh, Michael, mm -hmm. who in the audience would be uh, supportive of, uh, of a photo speed radar, uh, a return of, if, show your hands. Mm -hmm. Who would be diametrically opposed to that? Feels that it's a tax grab. So. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much okay, for thank, your Thank for you your very comments. much. Yeah. Pat? Uh, I just, I just had one comment, if I could, in regards to the technology thing. Yes. Pat, come on up. Come on up and get ready. I just, gotta, I just have a comment. I just wanted to see in regards to the cell phones. Has everybody here got a cell phone? Every single one of you? How many of you have the Waze app? Hands up for the Waze app. Have you heard of the Waze map? Okay. It's W-A-Z-E. It's an app. It's a navigation app. But the nice thing about it is there's a little button on there where you can press and say, there's a cop sitting here. And everybody else who's on the Waze goes, oh. And they slow down. All right? I do it. I'm not even speeding and I slow down. All right? And we have officers have done that as a project, gone up on Airport Road and taken our own Waze apps and going, hey, I'm right here. I'm a cop and I'm right here. And it, it's the people who use the Waze app 
will slow down because they think there's a cop there. So imagine if every one of you, going home from work, going out to get groceries, went, oh, you stop, and you're not supposed to do this while you're driving. And you hit and go, well, there's a cop here, right? So just food for thought. Pat, just, just before you, you give us a comment, um, this will reveal my age, but I can remember as a kid in Toronto, on the radio, they used to broadcast radar locations and it had a calming effect, but that's how they did it back in the 1960s and earlier. Pat. Yeah. I'm uh, Patricia Deans, live on Airport Road between 15 and 20, side roads, so that really bad area. I wanted to say thank you for what's going on here because you know, maybe a year, year and a half ago, I came before the Police Services Board, really quite upset. I was, I'd been hit on Airport Road uh, car totaled and so on. So <clears throat> had a personal experience. Um, so I'm very pleased with the increased uh, police presence. I think I'm seeing cars slow down, but also there are the crazies who pass on the hills, double solid line, trucks in tandem passing at intersections, uh, craziness. But I wondered about one thing. I really think the electronic sign has been helpful, a number of people who I see have remarked on it, its effectiveness. But it's a mobile one, <clears throat> excuse me, and I'm wondering whether you would consider moving it from time to time. After a while, people get quite used to it and stop reading. And I don't think it's all Toronto drivers, because we have a lot of people coming across the Hockley Road speeding. So the police presence is really effective, but I think the electronic signs are too. So when you see OPP target road, you know, you pay attention, you don't want a ticket. So I'm thinking if that sign gets moved around on airport road from time to time, it'll stir people. Okay, so. It's a, a good point. I, I don't know whether you noticed, we have a portable radar sign now that uh, we had on airport road. It's a the, the big sign like that, but it tells you what your speed is. No, where is that? Yeah, well, it, it moves <laughs> around. We, it, uh, they hook it up to the back of, a, of a, one of the big uh, police cars and uh, they haul it around to different locations. But we had it on Airport Road uh, in front of um, Laurie Haddock's uh, place for a few days and it, it really has a, a way of, you know, people see that they're doing 110, suddenly they put the binders on so mm -hmm. so uh, the the staff sergeant is having staff move it around within the county it's something that the county purchased mm -hmm. but Correct. we're deploying it around but uh, you know we can look at whether we want to uh, either a move that uh, sign that's down at the bottom to different locations or B see if we can get the county to pony up for uh, for another one possibly I think that's wonderful because I do think, you know, we lose track. We, <coughs> our minds wander and we find, oh, I'm going, f you know, five, ten kilometers over, and those are good reminders. And, uh, and then there's crazy people. But um, I think I appreciate the work that you've done. Thank you. So, thanks. Thank you very much. We, we've uh, uh, worked with the county to sharpen the message on their sign. Uh, they were using it to uh, advertise things like the load limit is in effect and uh, it's deer it's deer crossing season be careful and uh, have a nice day and I think we we convince them that the messages have to be more pointed and they have made them more pointed Ross Martin, 593-227, blind line, um, in Mono. Um, I'm uh, very much in favor of maximizing passing lanes. I frequently drive from Ottawa on Highway 7, uh, and uh, it's a road that's very, very difficult to find a place to safely pass. And I look forward to seeing a sign in another 2K, 5K, there's a passing lane. I don't know if that can apply on Airport Road at all. And I know it's a county issue that it would have to be dealt by them. 
But I think if there's any possibility of that, I think people knowing that they can stay where they are and within two, three kilometers, they're gonna get an opportunity to safely pass, it might help uh, reduce some of that speeding. Good evening. My name is Robert Mistrato. I live on the first line as well. I know that there's been a lot of talk tonight and I appreciate the conversations and, and the diligence around the speeding. The safety issue I want to talk about now is a new one and, and it affects us personally. Um, we're seeing more drones in the park. Uh, we back onto the park, the Island Lake Park, and again, as a father of teenage daughters, uh, I'll give you the last most recent example which really bothered me. Um, I happened to be in the pool and I'm looking up and there's a drone circling my neighbor's house, flying over my house, directly over the pool, staying there, and didn't fly away until I flipped him the bird. So clearly, there's videotaping going on. I also want to say that my house is one of the houses that was broken into from behind, from the park, and there's witnesses who saw the people go back into the park. So what I'm worried about now is with these drones, it's not just a social thing, I'm worried that this is going to become a launching pad for people checking out our yards, scoping out when people are coming and going. We have security, we have cameras, but having these things overhead, it's like opening the door for someone looking for nice possible ways to get into these homes. So how, how do we address this? I have no idea what the laws are. I'm tempted to get a slingshot. What do we have to do about these things? Maybe I can direct this, uh, this to the officers. We actually received uh, such a complaint just today, so which is why I'm familiar with it, on Transport Canada as well. So drones are, of course, regulated by Transport Canada. They're federally regulated. Uh, Transport Canada has a web page dedicated to drone safety that includes a uh, drone incident reporting form. It's an online form. One of the uh, complaints that you can file on that form is a privacy complaint. However, I need to temper that with, on the same website, they state very specifically that privacy complaints for drones are a local police matter. However, they're accepting such complaints. So I don't know what action they take, but they're obviously aware of the issue uh, because they allow that on this reporting form. So, so what are we, the residents supposed to do? What is our recourse? Is it calling the OPP? Is it you know, taking some, these, these things out of the sky? Uh, clearly, you see them flying back somewhere, and, and this one headed back over towards the Keelstone subdivision. But I think this is going to become a bigger and bigger problem as we allow more and more cars in, in that area. Not to make light of this, but Nikki, is this on your radar? Pardon me? Not to make light of this, but is this on your radar? Have you had incidents with regard to No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't aware of it. Did you call us? No, that, not that day, because the thing flew away after, again, I gave him the bird. Yeah. Um, as with everything else, I encourage you to call us. Mm -hmm. Even if we, we aren't able to take any action, we're aware, and once we can pinpoint a pattern, and sometimes people are like, hey, I'm gonna follow it and follow and find out where it goes, uh, we can take some action then. Whatever action we can take, we'll do our best mm -hmm. to take action. I, I would be disturbed too. I have a backyard in the city. I would be very upset to find a drone outside uh, above my pool or outside my house. Um, but it, it, this is the first I've heard about it, and I haven't had any complaints in the town so far so uh, you, you're noticing more and more of them so clearly there's something going on so please call us okay. uh, call about this one if you can remember the date and time and we can make a report of it and sure. if you happen to see if you happen to have an idea where it went right um, so call and ask the an officer they'll either call you or they'll come out and then just tell them which way it went and into the subdivision and then we can start to do uh, patterns with it right and we'll see what's going on Great. okay Thank you. If, if you're seeing it coming from the conservation area, it's against the uh, it's against the bylaw in the conservation area. There's no drones allowed. So if you saw that it, it's coming from there, call the park, and they'll send somebody out, and uh, they can actually uh, issue a ticket for that. Okay. There's actually signage at the gate uh, going into Island Lake. No drones. I remember seeing that one, but I'll yeah, take it's, a look it's I think it's recent. Uh, I noticed it a couple of weeks ago. Okay, thank uh, you. Also, thank you uh, about the B&E uh, okay. aspect of it and the casing of the homes. I think that's a very valid point, so that's why I really encourage you to give us a call okay. so that we can keep an eye on it. Will do. Thank you. Uh, hello, 
my name's Elaine St. Pierre. I live in the first line. Um, a bit of a follow-up, actually, to uh, this gentleman here in regards to the drones. I do want to point out that on the 12-page recommendation report by uh, uh, Parks and Rec Director Kim Perryman, her recommendations about leveling the playing field uh, indicated it was for random pickup sports and the flying of kites and drones. So I would caution council about encouraging that sort of behavior because I do feel the same. Um, I, I personally look at it that um, I don't believe that drone was there trying to sneak a peek at a bikini, but I believe that they're casing the homes because they know it's a closed off area that the police cannot see. They can't patrol unless they get out of their car and walk back there. And we've had a number of incidents, not only on first line, uh, I know there's been a lot of break-ins in the Fieldstone subdivision, but there was also many along Blue Heron, and all were accessed from, um, from the conservation area. And I'm very, very concerned about our safety um, when we are proposing uh, a bunch of development that just doesn't seem to address that. I also want to um, correct uh, Councillor Nix's comment when he was asking the question of uh, Staff Sergeant Randall um, indicating about a proposed parking lot and he stated that the majority of residents want a park. That is not true. The majority of residents are actually against uh, further development so I just want to put that out there since we're back to live recording our meetings now and they'll be back on our YouTube channel. I know for a period of time they were not, Fred, correct? Yeah, we're recording them right now to store but we're not yet streaming them on YouTube for, uh, for reasons to do with YouTube. Okay. So I'll maybe correct uh, Deputy Mayor Kerman as well because he said that they would be available to be streamed later, but that's not true, so. What I meant to say is that we aren't being streamed live right now, okay. but they will, be, they will be available on YouTube at a later date. Uh, okay. And I shouldn't have used the word streaming because that implies that it's live. Okay. Yeah. So my questions actually are um, mainly for Staff Sergeant Randall. Um, in terms of patrols in the Fieldstone and Island Lake subdivisions uh, in that area along first line, especially the dead end where there is a number of safety issues as well, because um, I think it's important to note that this is a community safety task force and we've spent 90% of our time tonight talking about speeding and that is certainly a safety issue, but nobody's talking about the, the true safety of the community and the break-ins and, and keeping us all safe and those preventative measures in terms of patrols. So the question I have is, is there a, a larger portion or larger proportion of officers patrolling this small geographic area where a large amount of the population resides or is it the same number of officers covering the same number of geography everywhere? Do you know what I'm saying? No. 15% of the population lives in a very small, like lives in about a two mile square area. Are there more officers patrolling that area than a two mile square area on Airport Road? Or so no, so how it works is uh, there's an officer assigned to your zone, there's an officer assigned to each zone, and then uh, there'll be a float officer who floats around. However, what we do is we target our activities for the day. I can give you an example for your subdivision. Uh, what we did was we made it a, a project, a community mobilization project, uh, and we assigned officers to attend down in the subdivision uh, every hour, at least one hour per shift per officer for a six week period. Uh, and during that time, we received a lot of feedback about the high visibility, and we also noticed a dramatic decrease in the number of offenses and the number of calls for service that we were getting, including mischief, noise, uh, trouble with youth, all of those kind of things. So what we do is we take that, the results from that, and we reassign the officers, and we assign them to pro patrol at certain times and, and through the day to be a deterrent. We also assign them to subdued patrols so people don't know we're there, right? And that's to try and identify if there's suspicious people in the neighborhood, stop them, find out what they're doing there. So is that helpful? It is, thanks. Um, so then my second question is, um, you referenced that, um, and I think a lot of the community members who were here, I wanna say about a year ago when Paul Nanceville was here, where we have the, when we, all the break-ins were actually happening. Um, and one of the things that you know, he implored us to do is if you see something, say something, call it in, that there needs to be, and you, you referenced it as well, there needs to sort of be a record in order for us to be able to bump up the patrols. 
So my question is, what is the magic number? Because I can, I can probably speak on behalf of my neighbors on first line. We all have called on a number of occasions. Um, the dead end uh, down at the lake is very unique in that um, you can probably be 200 feet away from the dead end and you can't tell if there's a car because the circle is so uh, wide in scope that they could be right in the circle hiding there and you won't know it until you're right down getting your mailbox key out of your pocket. <laughs> And, um, and it's not, uh, you know, we've reported just vehicles hanging out, see people smoking weed inside the car, nice little cloud of smoke inside. We've seen people having sex in the vehicles. We've seen all sorts of things going on and just somewhere, I don't know what that number of people and that number of cars would be doing down there if it wasn't something nefarious. So my question is, we call, we report, and we never see anybody. I'm home every day. Um, I work from home, I walk my dog three times a day, and we don't see anybody. And I'm one of those people that we ask for a call back and we don't get the call back. So mm -hmm. just comment on that, please. Yeah. So comment on, or I didn't uh, run an analysis of, of uh, calls for service that we've received down in there in the last little while. The project that we undertook was in uh, January and February, March. So I don't know how many calls for service I've had. Anecdotally, I can tell you my experience is, People will call us for and call us, and we'll go out and we'll investigate, but then people stop calling us, even though they think the neighbor called or they called, and then they haven't really. And for example, I have another subdivision over in another community where I've been called and said, we've been calling police over and over and over again, and you're not doing anything. And I ran the occurrence reports for the address for the street for the municipality, and there were no calls. So I don't know like it, a lot of times it's people think that, uh, that others are calling in or they think that they're continuing calling in and they're not. So you have to keep calling. And then I reiterate to the officers, you wanna hear back from them, right? What happened? And then, and I will tell you, they won't call you at two o'clock in the morning. And then unfortunately, if it's their last shift and they're off for five days, they probably won't call you when they get back because they will have the, gone on to something else. So it's important to reiter reiterate that you want that call back and it's important to keep calling every time. And then it's important to understand that if we see somebody down in there and we go down there and they're having sex, there's no charge for that, right? So, so uh, and if they're smoking cigarettes or they're just chatting, there's no charge for that. They're not smoking cigarettes, but. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the, the question I have it's not when you're driving. You can't drive and. How did they get there? How are they leaving? Exactly. So the question I have is about these, uh, you know, traffic cameras. Then, is that something that could be implemented for a community safety perspective? Can we make that area, which is, you know, we've kind of seen time and again that that is where all the trouble is coming from. Can we make it a no parking zone and then here's the camera and if you stop here for more than 10 minutes, we're gonna send you a ticket. Can I ask a question? Where's Robert Castrato? Because I think your wife, Susan, is is she the head of the neighborhood watch on no, first line? Oh, okay. I hope, because going back a year or so ago, there was talk of, of a, on Mark uh, uh, Darby's, or at least right at the, at the circle that you're talking about, of putting a camera up. I haven't heard anything more about that, but but I know there was talk of putting a camera up. Yeah, we were talking about putting a camera up there, and then um, they were putting a camera up there, and then they came and Sometimes, sometimes even a, a phony camera can be a deterrent, uh, but let's hope that it isn't, it's a real deterrent, not just a make-believe deterrent. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can certainly look at that, and I know Mark Darby has very strong views about what, what occurs in that circle, as do other residents in proximity to it. Uh, and, and, and let me let me say something that I, I was trying to say earlier on, and that was uh, we did deliberately call this the Community Safety Task Force, not the Speeding Task Force. Um, and we were mindful when we set it up that there were uh, B&E issues, especially uh, in your 
neighborhood and over in Fieldstone in particular. Um, we haven't heard as much about them lately because there has been, I think, a decline in the, in the number of uh, instances, but they still happen. And I know of people who have been actually burglarized more than once. Uh, so we have to we have to bear in mind uh, that uh, whatever recommendations we come up with uh, uh, cover off that that issue. Uh, if, for instance, we did a an enhancement, uh, we we're well aware that the um, the officer may be called off their particular traffic duties to deal with other issues and that does happen now with uh, with uh, our 70.75% uh, 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 officer he's not uh, absolutely married to traffic all the time although you'd, you'd never know it from his effectiveness but he can as I understand it be called off for other uh, situations as they arise in in the town of Mono I would keep in mind, though, that Staff Sergeant Randall did indicate that if any foot patrol was going to be done, it would have to be two officers, correct, and not just one. So. Well, I I I would see uh, maybe a better solution, um, and and let's let's face it, this is a proposal that is coming to council. We have not yet passed on it, uh, but uh, for for hypothetical purposes, if we did, um, I would see a situation where the the officer would drive down there and look and turn around and come back. Not necessarily uh, a foot patrol at 11.30 at night. I think it's a situation where it calls for a drive in and not simply a drive by, which is how it is currently monitored. Okay, thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Marissa Russell. I live on French Drive, and my concern is um, fireworks. Is there a bylaw uh, against fireworks in the subdivision? Uh, personally, I found remnants of fireworks very close to my, my home, right by my air conditioner, and, um, and still, uh, the people still let them off in the subdivision. I don't know if they're in their backyards or where they're letting them off, but um, my, myself and my neighbor, we have found remnants and still with, I don't know what, is it gunpowder in there or something? It's, so it's, uh, and I even put a post up on Facebook uh, this past, um, I believe it was May 1st or for July 4th, or for, sorry, for July 1st, that um, to be mindful to the people that live in the subdivision and the people that are letting them off in their backyard. Like I, I said, whatever goes up uh, must come down and it is still lit, it's still on fire and it can cause damage. We have our patio furniture out, uh, which can catch fire. We have trees, we have all kinds of so uh, you know, sorts of things. And that's another safety concern that uh, we have. I, I could. I'm looking over at Fred, Fred Simpson, but I know we've discussed fireworks in the past, and we have two bylaws that may or may not be relevant. One is our, our fire bylaw, the other one is our noise bylaw. And I'm going on memory, Fred, I don't think currently either one of those bylaws specifically addresses fireworks, do they? Uh, I really should review them, but no, I don't think either of them address. I don't think we have any bylaw that specifically talks about fireworks, perhaps noise, like you say, but not not specifically restricting fireworks like other than in parks other than the town park it, it's not in the fire bylaw I've, i recently read the fire bylaw and, and have a motion before uh, council on s the size of an allowable um, uh, burn um, but I know other municipalities are, are wrestling with this. I was talking to somebody from uh, Shelburne or Melanchthon uh, just the other day, literally 24 or 48 hours ago, and they were saying that this is, this is arising in other places. I can remember when you could only buy fireworks uh, a few days prior to uh, uh, you know, uh, Victoria Day and, uh, and uh, Dominion Day, as it was then called, uh, and you could not buy fireworks uh, after that. Exactly. No, they're available um, in the parking lot. Of well, I exactly. think it's a good point, John. I think I think maybe we should. We should I, 
I'm not going to promise a solution tomorrow, but we sure. probably at council we should look at this. Yeah, I appreciate it because um, you know houses have been burnt down, caused by fireworks, and uh, I don't want to see my house go down. I was I was already robbed. I don't, you know, from uh, my jewelry is all taken, and I don't want my house burnt down. I I thought I came up to a beautiful community up here, peaceful, and um, you know I just don't want any. Anything to happen, um, you know, and it also comes down to, I think, respect for others. I think uh, people forget that, forget um, that there's other people living there, like among them, and uh, as as well as the speeding, they they don't care. Um, they're just either in a hurry, something's on their mind or whatever, and they don't care about people that live on on French Drive and they just go speeding by and you know I have grandchildren they come visit I watch them once a week um, they come on the weekends and you know there's other children on the street and I don't want to see uh, a child being hurt I, I, if I could just throw in one comment and yeah. again I, I mentioned this to our director of public works it's not that I've lost this argument it's just it's never gone past the discussion stage the there is a traffic calming device that that I think is really great. If you drive east over to the 400 and go through Bond Head, as you come up the hill past the golf course into Bond Head where the speed limit really slows down, they've put up these uh, plastic uh, cones right, right in the roadway, the center of the roadway and the side of the roadway. Now they're wide enough to let a vehicle go through them, but psychologically, you, when you see, and by the way, if you hit the cones, nothing would happen, they just bend mm -hmm. over. Um, my sense is, but I haven't got any data on this, is w which is what I need to convince our director of public works to look at it seriously, that they really do have a calming effect because your instinct is, oh, got to slow down, get through those two cones, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We are looking at that, but but in a very casual way, okay? I, I mean, I think something like French Drive would be a great place to... Yeah, anything to help because um, people, um, you know, people live there and... So, and it's, it's some people that live in the subdivision that are are speeding, not do not. They're just going through the, the stop uh, stop sign on Anderson and and French that I observed, and um, you know they come to the they slow down a bit and then they pick up speed to turn to make the the uh, to get onto French Drive, and and they pick up speed by the time they're on first first line. So the other traffic calming device that, that I'm going to be recommending, and uh, there's a, a delegation that is coming to uh, a council uh, to talk about the third line, and uh, their concern is that there's speeding down in the vicinity of the Hockley, uh, Hockley Road, uh, and that is, uh, they call it colloquially, a rumble strip. It's basically etched pavement, mm -hmm. so that as you're approaching an intersection, uh, you hear this r noise and it's your tires interacting with etching on mm -hmm. the road and I think that has a, uh, has a, a an impact it reminds you that maybe you need to slow down mm -hmm. uh, lest your tires get affected I guess I, I don't know yes but that may it might be something that's applicable on mm -hmm. French drive and also um, I've observed that some some people um, like to show off and um, they like to hear their vehicle make noise, and they're just going, r uh, you know, f really fast past uh, on French Drive. So, um, yeah, that there's more of a concern than, you know, and a problem there. It has has uh, been a little bit better with, and, and we also have a 40 kilometer max sign on our front lawn on the uh, light post. And people just ignore that. There's no respect, like for, like I said before. Um, I don't know if <coughs> if it would be beneficial. <coughs> sorry, to send a letter out to all the residents. Maybe, you know, people need reminders. You know, um, it, 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 we're we're our, you know we're humans and we do forget. But a letter saying, you know what, there's a problem. You know, keep it to the speed limit. There's children that live here, and I don't know if that would work. Th thank you for those comments, and uh, I'll just say, uh, I I'm 
not in favor of going cheap by putting stop signs on lamp posts. Um, I failed my first driver's exam because I missed a stop sign on a lamp post, uh, and I argued strenuously with the examiner that that wasn't fair. It should have been on its own standalone post. And, and he yeah. said, "No, don't come back in two weeks' time and rewrite." Right. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, so we have people who shoot in our neighborhood, uh, guns. Um, there's no shooting range on our road, but some Sundays it's just shooting, 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 shooting all day long. And I'm just wondering, do we have any laws about that? We are basically in a residential neighborhood. It's not a subdivision, but we're basically in a residential neighborhood. And when, when the shooting starts, we don't even leave our house because we don't know where it's coming from necessarily and where the bullets are landing. Is there, are there any laws about that or anything we can do about that other than wearing protective vests? <laughs> you want mine? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, there, are, there are laws on the books. There's bylaws that can be enacted and there is a bylaw in effect in the town of Mono. So it depends. Um, we did have an incident a few weeks ago where there was somebody who called in and said, listen, I'm gonna be target shooting. This is when I'm gonna start and this is when I'm gonna finish. Unfortunately, the officers didn't realize that the person was starting their target shooting when they should have been ending their target shooting. So there's no target shooting permitted after dusk. Okay. So, and before dawn. Okay. People can uh, target shoot on their own property as long as they're within the guidelines of the um, criminal code. Uh, and I would uh, tell you that I have to look at the criminal code every time I go to one of these calls to make yeah. sure that it's the right area and the right distance away. It's very similar to hunting. Uh, if someone is gonna go hunting, they have to have permission from the, home, the, the landowner. They have to be so far away from a residential area, depending on the kind of firearm that they're using and that kind of stuff. So okay. is that helpful? So there are laws on the books. There's, okay. there's bylaws out there. Different neighborhoods have different bylaws. And then um, it always comes back to the fact of whether or not the person that's calling in is actually licensed to have a firearm, what kind of firearms they're using. So. Right. Uh, does that answer your question? So would it be something I could just call you guys up and say, here's where we live. Is target practice next door a legal thing? Yeah. Or should we call when they're doing it? Or Yeah, call when they're doing it. We get, okay. we get calls. I tell you, quite routinely, we get calls for people who think that shots are fired. Sometimes it's this ladies' fireworks that's right. happening. Other right. times, like people in, the people in Mono are, are uh, aware of what a firearm sounds like. There's lots of hunting that's gone on for years here, and, yeah. and most of the time you can tell what a firearm yeah. sounds like. So please do give us a call if okay. we are aware. Uh, a lot of times it's the more considerate people that will call the communication center and they'll say, I'm gonna be target shooting between uh, 12 noon and 1 p.m. Here's okay. where I live in case you get any calls. Oh, and then okay. when people call us, then we yeah. go, yes, we, we're aware that it's okay. happening. Right? Okay. There are certain residences where people do it on a routine basis. Mm -hmm. I know on a Sunday afternoon it's quite a pain. I would prefer to sit by the pool and, and, yeah. and uh, sip a Perrier and listen to the birds than yeah. listen to the birds fly away yes. from the gunfire. Yes. Uh, just uh, for, for clarity with regard to Mono, we do have a bylaw there's to be no discharge of firearms on Mono property, period, under any circumstances. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, hunting is governed by <laughs> provincial legislation and that says that there shall not be any hunting uh, half hour after sunset or half hour uh, before uh, sunrise. Uh, and, and I don't believe there's any exceptions. Uh, I have a, a motion before council uh, that would prohibit discharge of firearms for quote, recreational purposes. Uh, and I was mm -hmm. convinced uh, uh, that that was appropriate given coyote issues and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and the wording of that is, is consistent with the provincial legislation with regard to hunting. So half hour uh, before sunset, half an hour before sunrise, uh, no recreational discharge of firearms. Right. Because it's very disconcerting to have guns going off in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
ask each member of the task force if they'd like to make some observations or comments, uh, and I'll try and describe where I hope we, uh, we go from here. Uh, and uh, before I do, I, I just want to thank our, our staff, um, Fred Simpson, who's uh, kindly agreed to uh, run the, uh, the equipment tonight, and uh, Andrew Dahmer, who's our uh, web designer, who put together the uh, uh, material that we saw on screen, and we'll probably be taking that and converting it uh, to, uh, to our website. Uh, and they, they've been extraordinarily helpful, and I've been out of town for the past uh, 48 hours, and uh, communicating by way of email, and it all came together, I hope, I hope well, uh, but they did a wonderful job. Does anyone want to, to say anything uh, before we uh, conclude the meeting? John? Uh, I'm on Hockley Road, and I know enforcement has to be, and that's the number one, is you have to have more enforcement. Unfortunately, we don't have the numbers that you'd need to bring anything down, and that's why uh, I'm a firm believer when it comes to, although the rules aren't there yet, that I believe for the, the province of Ontario have to pass it for the photo radar. They do it in Europe. Uh, we just have to wait until somebody has a, the gumption down there at Queen's Park to pass it, not just for school zones, so you can post it wherever you want. And uh, in Europe, they do have, uh, they'll let you know. So, uh, speed radar up ahead, slow down. Mm -hmm. So it, it's as easy as it's a 24 hours, you're just paying for the installation of it and whatever uh, ad administrative. And there you got it, it's like having an officer there 24 hours a day and, and if you've got a problem in your area, that's this is where we need that. But we're not that, we're not there yet, either with the technology or the rules uh, that the province of Ontario has to pass. And uh, hopefully when that happens, we can, uh, as a township, we can through council, you say this is where we're going to post it. The citizens have said we have a problem here. Uh, that's only for the speeding. As, as, as far as the criminality, it's a, you see something, say something, call them in, and say even if it's uh, something minute. Eventually, the officer will come around and, and either make a report or they'll know that there's something going on because we are an extension of the police force, uh, as citizens, and uh, just step up you see something it's I don't know if it's an overload I mean a number of calls that come in there eventually they'll get they'll get to it and make a report on it I have an aviation background, so uh, with regard to drones, I'll make a comment that I know that uh, there are no no around the airports, uh, and Transport Canada enforce that rigorously. There are violators all the time, but they do follow up and they do catch people. So uh, my suggestion to whoever has a problem with drones is to take a good picture of it. Uh, the model is important, color, and if you can enlarge, sometimes they have a serial number. Uh, direction where it comes from, direction where it goes to, and uh, the exact locations where you are. Not in mono, but over my swimming pool, over my house, over my shack. And you will not get the same priority as the airports do, but they tend to follow up on that, especially when it becomes an urgency. So that's with that. Um, the other comment I'm surprised to see so many comment on speeders and, and non on crimes. So that, in my opinion, speaks volume to either the peaceful society that we are in Mono or that we have a good police in, uh, in this town. That, in my opinion, is sufficient uh, to uh, feel comfortable. I lived here for four years and I'm hoping to live another 10, 15 years more <laughs> before they put me to green pasture somewhere. And um, yeah, and so uh, compliments to, to the OBP officer that have done a good job, I think. I never use their services, so I can't comment how good or bad they are. And I like to keep it that way for the next whatever time I have left. Um, uh, yeah, I, I live on Airport Road, and, and that has been an issue, ongoing issue <laughs> Yes, So uh, like I said, I don't, um, I'm not too concerned to the 10, 15, or even 20 kilometers over over speed limit. But when you see people passing, uh, and I'm talking about 140, 150, 
I, I know speed because I've worked with speed all my life. Uh, and uh, when you see them coming up and hauling that engine at uh, six, 7,000 RPM, you know that that thing is moving. And I live on the known uh, mono, it's been the area in front of my house is known as uh, the Mono 500. Because on Saturday night they change the oil and then they just, sorry, Saturday morning they change the oil and then they go and test it. So they have to rev up the engine to lubricate the engine. I don't know what they do, but I get my oil change at the shop, so I don't know that. So, yeah, uh, I comment on, on the, you know, everything uh, seems to be doing a good job with police officer comment. Congratulations to that. And, uh, and with the drones, just provide details. They need details. Uh, otherwise, they can't do any work. Thank you. Just a, a comment, um, and I completely back up the issue of community safety as much as road safety. Um, but the trick for us is going to have to be how we're able to do it with the resources that are available to us. And we all know that uh, you know, Mono is a fairly big town and there are you know, limited amount of resources that have to be spread over this big piece of toast. So um, it, it, it's the creativeness of our district commander on how she's able to deploy these resources. And if we can give her some more tools, i.e some more officer or three quarters of another officer or some more paid duty that allows her to have more tools in her belt to able to, to put out all these fires that, that come up. I think one of the other things that uh, is new to us that uh, you may not be aware of is we now have auxiliary OPP here in, in, in Mono. We never had that before. You see them in Orangeville all the time uh, whenever there's a rib fest or something wandering around. Well, our uh, OPP auxiliary will be doing more um, proactive type of activities, which could include, uh, you know, going for the walk, the two of them in through the park and, and, and some things like that. So that's something that you're going to see. Um, and in order to cover off our community safety issues and road safety issues, we're going to have to look at things like speed cameras at cameras at the end of the cul-de-sac to protect Mark Darby. God bless his soul. <laughs> uh, noisy guy. And, and, and to deal with, uh, look at all these other types of technology that um, may help us to solve the problems. Traffic calming devices, whether it's traffic circles, you know, there's going to be a lot of, of lobbying is going to have to be done by our our, uh, our town fathers uh, once this report comes out, but uh, but I think that uh, you folks are all you know right on the right on the mark with the comments that you've made, and uh, I also back up uh, Tom and, and uh, Captain Bernadetti on on the uh, uh, the comments that the OPP are serving us well, and we just need to give them more tools to uh, help them do the job. Well, I had a great night. I think this was terrific. I appreciated the presentations. I appreciated the questions and the suggestions. I appreciated the OPP. I've got 17 pages of notes, and I'll, have <laughs> and I'll go through them. But it was a great night. I'll just be quite brief, um, because I am on council. I, I, we haven't written a report yet, but this committee will be making a report to council. And my suggestion to John will be that um, I think we should be looking at, because our OPP contract is up this year, we should be looking at some enhancement for next year's budget. The, the, the caution, and I want to pick up on some of Mike's comments, though, is this. Um, I've been on council for nine years, and we've never increased our budget by more than the Ontario CPI. We've been very frugal. In fact, our residential tax rate in Mono, this is just the, the Mono portion, not the county or the school board, is less than one half of Orangeville's. And we fought hard to do that, and sometimes there's been some tears at budget time. So while I do think in the report we made to Council, John, we should be making some recommendations, whether they're for traffic calming or enhancements, I gotta tell you, there's a lot of things coming down the road this year at budget time. 
and it's, it's going to be a scary year. This is just one of them. I don't know if you heard the announcement from the province this morning, but so while I would like us to do more on uh, have more uh, policing next year, uh, it's going to be a difficult budget budget time. Um, I'd like to start by thanking all of you for attending and, and the quality of questions was superb and, and the challenges we have are, are daunting. Uh, to the issue of, of the police budget, at the outset I indicated that our, our first uh, OPP contract was in the late 1990s. My recollection is that uh, we paid uh, at that time between six and seven hundred thousand dollars for policing and now we're only paying only paying 1.1 million dollars and yet our population has increased by over 25 percent during that period of time. So that really speaks I think to the necessity of, of a thoroughgoing review of uh, whether we have uh, adequate uh, policing and when I say adequate I don't mean that, uh, that they aren't responding, uh, they are responding, people are happy with the response but there's just so much more going on now than there was in 1998. And a lot of that going on has to do with the roads and it has to do with what happens when you build large subdivisions that attract people who want to break into homes. So um, I personally will be arguing very strenuously that we need to uh, look at uh, enhancement uh, that we really have been skimping over the years on our policing. Uh, we do, as I say, recapture some of those increased costs through increased fines. Uh, we're fighting very hard to improve the efficiency of the provincial offenses system uh, such that uh, we get back more money uh, and we spend less on administration and that's something that we're doing at the county. Um, but uh, I, I think it is, uh, it's an investment it's not so much a cost. So uh, it would be my hope that we write a report. Uh, we will submit it to Mono Council. Hopefully uh, they will endorse it and we have members of council here tonight which is, uh, is gratifying. Uh, the mayor sends her regrets by the way uh, for uh, reasons that uh, were beyond her control. She couldn't attend this evening. Uh, I will end with this and that is no matter what we say and what we do, we're going to need your help. We're going to need your support in lobbying the provincial government to make fundamental changes in the way it thinks about some of these things. I've already had the experience uh, as recently as yesterday trying to argue the photo radar uh, um, uh, matter and it was, it was met with skepticism. It was met with, oh, we've been there, we've done that and people didn't like it. And all I could do was to counter by saying it wasn't done properly and it wasn't done well when we did it in the 1990s. We need to revisit that. I've also argued strenuously for the increase in the fines. And quite frankly, people are skeptical because that's considered potentially a cash grab. I don't think it's a cash grab. I think it's a syntax. And, uh, I think that we need we need those additional revenues that will flow from that to offset additional police uh, additional appropriate policing costs. So we will have that information on how you can contact your MPP who is not without influence and how you can contact the Minister of Transportation and we're going to need all the help we can get. And on that happy note, thank you again and feel free to contact us if you have any further ideas.